to begin with. Are there any questions or comments that may have come up for you uh, since we talked yesterday? Yes? Um, it seems like any kind of mental formation, even the wholesome ones, has a little bit of stress. The stress comes from clean, not necessarily from the mental formation, or in met- or mental formation inherently is is more stressful than no, than less mental formation. The um, the stress that you're referring to. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, what you what you mean is the stress that we experience because of clinging, uh, and 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 the the clinging is when, whenever there is some we're experiencing a, a mental formation. Uh, we we tend to to like it or, or not like it. You know? Yes. And so that's really, that's where the stress is coming from, is that uh, we have some uh, dissatisfaction with it if it's something that we don't like, or we're going to try to hold on to that which is impossible to hold on to because it's, uh, it's, already <laughs> it's already getting away from us as soon as we start trying to grab onto it. That's what the stress is. I see, so it's entirely possible to have... A mental formation, liking and disliking of it, without clinging. It is, yes, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, if you do the kind of practice where instead of having a fixed object, that you develop a very spacious kind of awareness, um, what you will notice immediately when you do this is that. Uh, as objects arise and pass away, there is this tendency of the mind to try to grasp them. And and the point of doing this kind of practice is learning to let them go immediately, just let them be, not not try to grasp them, to allow them to arise and pass away. Or as is sometimes described as, say, to liberate them at the instant of their arising. So that's, that's the meaning of the phrase, to to liberate a thought or to liberate a sensation at the instant of its arising is means not to cling to it. And in that case, it is a completely tranquil experience where you know the, the stress that you're talking about is, is, is not present. And by practicing in that way, you know of course that carries over to be, being uh, uh, more or less grasping, or <laughs> uh, uh, less grasping in uh, in all of the other instances in our life. A lot of our experience, there's really uh, there's really not much motivation for grasping uh, to take place anyway. It's just habitual. So the mind can be very, very creative if it's if it doesn't cling on to any idea. It can be extremely fluid and free. That's right. Yes, the mind will be creative. It is the nature of of the mind itself that uh, what it does is a result of past causes and conditions, and that will spent spontaneously occur. It's the it's the intention in the moment that we're talking about here that leads to the grasping. So you can just allow you can just allow the manifestations of uh, of effect as a result of existing causes to just take place without needing to react to it. And uh, the interesting thing is that. Uh, uh, Everything becomes so much more, so much easier then, you know, because you're not, you, you you're not in this place of, of trying to control, you know, trying to make things happen. So. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> 
mindfulness, breath can help people when they die, right? Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit how this one works? To help people when they die? Yeah, um, yeah how the breath, we, we practice mm-hmm. them, you know, mm-hmm. right now. How this <coughs> help Okay. There are there are several different ways that it can be helpful depending on what you have learned to do with the breath. But if you have practiced using the breath for a long time, then you can immediately come into a place of, of tranquility and non-resistance. And uh, death can be very unpleasant, uh, very painful, often the things that happen to the body that cause it to finally cease to function are associated with uh, a, a lot of pain and discomfort. And if you do, if you accomplish nothing more than just being able to not resist that pain, that is an advantage. Likewise, if you, uh, for a Uh, a a person who is not enlightened and who is therefore still clinging to their sense of self, uh, death produces, uh, uh, it is terrifying because it is the the sense of loss of self and the fear of loss of self that uh, makes the experience of of dying uh, very, very frightening. And if you, uh, to the degree that you have been able to cultivate tranquility and equanimity, then you can likewise let go of that fear and that resistance to the process that's actually taking place. And just to let go and to go with it. Uh, You can do for yourself. There are people whose profession is to help people through the process of dying. And uh, a lot of what they do is to encourage them to just stop resisting, to just let go, just to let go, just to let go, to stop struggling and, and, and fighting. And so you can do that for yourself if you have, uh, if you have some skill. Just you trained with the breath for a long time and you go to the breath meditation, and these uh, mental states that you've cultivated using the breath will come up quite easily. Now, beyond that, you can, uh, as the, uh, how to put this, at the moment of death, the mind ceases its constructing activities and the true nature of reality and the ultimate experience of emptiness is available. And so it is said that uh, any person can achieve enlightenment at the moment of death. So if you are in a meditative state at the moment of death and if you are not yet and enlightened being, you can uh, achieve enlightenment in, at that last point, at the, at the uh, uh, occurrence of the, of the clear light associated with the dissolution of, of the mind's constructing activities. Now, of course, if you're an enlightened being, then there's no self there to die anyway. This is just the dissolution of the mind and the body. And so you can uh, uh, simply enter into the uh, uh, abiding in emptiness as the process of dissolution takes place. So these these are the different ways that that uh, you can use the breath and the meditation skills you've developed at the time of death. I hear. Some book, I mean, read some book said there's a different light mm-hmm. when people pass away. 
they should follow. But if the ordinary people, they don't, they are not enlightened yet. Mm -hmm. um, if we, if we are a system, a system, right? If we help them, mm -hmm. if family, right? If family, parents, you know, mm -hmm. how we can uh, instruct? them to, you know, peaceful go away now. How we can do that? <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a pretty big topic there. <laughs> but, let's see what we can say about it. Um, Are, are you thinking of somebody who hasn't ever meditated and who doesn't have... Yeah, there are different kind of people because uh, in one week I face, in five days, mm -hmm. I have three friends. They, they just go, you know, I, you know, I, I just, mm -hmm. I just think one day we need, we need help them. Because mm -hmm. I really face one I don't know how to talk to her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for example, that uh, if somebody has uh, cancer mm -hmm. or uh, some disease that uh, they're kind of knowing that uh, they're going away, uh, and they never had any training mm -hmm. whatsoever, uh, how can we help them in such a way? Well, there is, uh, you're limited in what you can do to help them because they'll have all of their habitual ways of responding to the pain and the fear that they're experiencing. But that is what you can help them the most with, is the pain and the fear. Uh, and that's the, the basic principle that the suffering, the mental aspect of suffering comes entirely from resistance. And physical pain in itself is much less of a problem when there is no resistance to it. You know, and uh, my friend Shenzhen Young always, you know, teaches people that uh, suffering is pain times resistance. And it's mathematical. So if you have 10 units of pain and 10 units of resistance, you've got 100 units of suffering. And if you've got 10 units of pain and you've got zero resistance, you've got zero suffering. 10 times zero is zero, right? Um, and this, if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't know this, you might be able to help them to discover this by simply uh, encouraging them just to uh, allow the pain to be there without, without fighting against it, to just examine the pain for, for what it is. It, pain intrudes upon your attention. That's the nature of it. You can't ignore physical pain when it's intense. So what you can do is you can direct your attention towards it, as all of you have already discovered. You have the, the comparatively speaking, rather trivial pains that arise during meditation. And as you know, you focus your attention on them, and instead of struggling against them, trying to make them go away, wishing they weren't there, all of these other things, you examine them and they cease to be as, uh, as disturbing and as difficult. Uh, and at some point they may even become just another sensation. And uh, while they still have the quality of pain, there's no mental disturbance that takes place with it. 
So one thing that you could do with, with any person, whether they're dying or not, who's experiencing pain, is to try to teach them this principle that the suffering that's associated with pain is going to be related to the amount of resistance that they have towards the pain. And the opposite of that is just the, the acceptance and the being with it and the allowing it to be. So this is a way that you can help anybody with, with pain. As I say, you're limited because some people, you know, some people you might not, you might not be able to succeed in, in communicating this to them or they might be too strongly conditioned by a habitual resistance to pain to make much difference. But it is the one thing that you can do. But every kind of suffering involves resistance. You know, uh, in the Four Noble Truths, when we say, you know, that uh, uh, the nature of our existence is permeated by suffering, by dissatisfactoriness, which is what dukkha means. And the second truth is that the cause of uh, suffering, suffering has a cause, and its cause is craving, which is essentially the desire for things to be different than they are the non-acceptance of what is, the resistance to what is. The Buddha was known as as the Tathagata, which means gone to suchness, or isness, or what is. And that is the ultimate non-resistance, and it is corresponds to the complete end of suffering. Death is inevitable, and To the degree that a person is able to surrender to the fact, the inevitability of their death, it becomes less terrifying. And so one of the things that you can do is to try as much as possible to help the person to accept what's happening. Sometimes, now, Shinzen Young who uses this formula, he's a great meditation teacher. And he also is one of those people that spends a lot of his time uh, helping people uh, to die. And uh, one of what, what he does is encourages them to accept, and sometimes when there's a lot of resistance, what he has to do is is point out the positive side of this that that the pain will soon be gone, that it will soon be over, that what lies on the other side is peace. Uh, so that so that you know to generate these ideas to counteract somewhat the resistance that a person has. But he says, and this is the same thing we say talking about meditation and enlightenment is let go. Just, just let go. Don't try to control it. Don't try to stop what cannot be stopped. Don't try to hold on to what can't be held on to. Just let go. Let be what is. And let happen what must happen. And to be a part of the flow and the process rather than to struggle against the current. Know she she's dying. Right? Mm-hmm. She said, "I don't know where to go. I she don't want to give up because uh, she has the you know the oxygen help." Mm-hmm. You know? Um, she know after they pull out this oxygen, she will die. But she said, "I don't know where to go. I'm nervous." Mm-hmm. Uh, but these kind of people how we can reduce their fear. Mm-hmm. How we can instruct them, so, because there are people at a different place, different night, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and hell, some, some light, different heaven, you know, I don't know. Uh, right at this moment, she's 
really, really afraid. Mm-hmm. How you can tell her, say, hey, let's go, let's go, but it's easy to talk. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and saying let go is not the same as saying go ahead and take out the two. That's saying let go of your resistance. Uh, you'll take out the tube when you're ready, but just try to be. Be in the moment. Be with what you are. Whatever you is, or what, what, whatever is happening and whatever you are in the moment, that's perfect. Be with that. As far as this concern, if somebody says, well, there's these different lights, and I don't know which one I'm, I don't know where I'm supposed to go, I don't know which one I'm supposed to follow. <laughs> you know, that's really something that's important to let go is just to have trust, to have confidence, to come from, you know, one of the things, the best thing that any person can do is to come from a place of, uh, of love and get outside of themselves and their attachments to themselves and, and come to a place of love. So whether, no matter what this person's beliefs might be somewhere in those beliefs there there is a place for uh, for love and compassion and concern for something outside of themselves and greater than themselves so if you know this person and you can guide them to think in those terms to find to find that then you can assure them that they will know you know in their heart they'll know where to go in their heart, they'll know what light to follow, because they they have their own innate goodness. Or if they are a Buddhist, it's the Buddha nature. They can rely on their Buddha nature, which will be revealed as as the mind dissolves and the uh, defilements that uh, uh, are contained with the mind dissolved and they kind of rely on their Buddha nature to guide them. So it's a very difficult thing. Uh, you know, on the one hand, I, uh, it's a challenge for any person to have people they know die. But on the other hand, to be able to be in a position to help those people in whatever you, way you can. That is a wonderful opportunity. So, I'm both uh, uh, happy happy for you and uh, sad for you that this is is what is happening in your life, but it's actually quite wonderful. You said that an enlightened person would abide in emptiness? Yes. When they pass on, is that um, indefinitely? <laughs> what happens to the Buddha at the time of his death? Does he exist or not exist, or both exist or not exist, or neither exist or not exist? <laughs> he abides in emptiness uh, timelessly. Oh, is it easy? Oh, sorry. Please, the thing. <laughs> What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I think she's Without um, reappearing, I guess it's kind of my question. Without reappearing. Mm-hmm. Well, You see, there's a problem with trying to discuss something at two incompatible levels. One of uh, relative reality and other at ultimate reality. So ultimate reality, I... You can't speak of ultimate reality in terms of appearance because appearance is relative. 
And so if you try to say a question, you know, you're starting to ask the question, well, what happens to the Buddha? And then uh, what happens to the enlightened person? And then there is the concept of this uh, this individuality, this personhood, as being substantial rather than empty. And um, uh, you're just you're not going to get anywhere. So let's just stay at the level of uh, relative reality. We see the manifestation of. Uh, Buddhas in the world. And the Buddha nature is universal. So as long as there are the appearances of a world and people, there will be Buddhas manifesting in the world. And there will be the Buddha nature in the world. So if it's convenient for you in terms of your understanding to conceive of the enlightened being that's passing away uh, as having some identity with the Buddhas that manifest. There's nothing wrong with that. But it, that involves a, a clinging to a particular kind of perception that in order for you to become a Buddha yourself, you'll have to let go of. But there's nothing wrong with holding that as long as you're willing to let go of it when it begins to get in your way. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is, that was, that is, uh, this is in the category of questions that the Buddha refused to answer. The unanswerable questions. He just he kept silent, but, you know, and, uh, and and there were quite a few different times when he was in one form or another challenged to answer these questions, and he consistently refused, giving several different reasons. On some occasions, saying that the question is unanswerable because it's based on false premises, which is basically what I was saying to you now. Uh, more often, he said, the answers to that, such questions and the answers to such questions make no contribution to the practice of the spiritual life. And he gave that as his reason for refusing to answer them. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, earlier you were saying um, that... Uh, if a person is in a meditative state and and dies, yes. there's, a, there's a possibility that, that this person may achieve enlightenment. And, yeah. and, and I, I, um, I like uh, to know more about it. Is it because the six senses were terminated and then they, what's left of it, you said, is the ultimate reality? Yes. When, when, they, when they see that... Uh, they achieve enlightenment, and that same uh, achievement can be done through meditation as well. When yeah. we deepen our med- meditation, we observe past the six senses. Yes. And it's the ultimate reality. Yeah. Okay. I see. And why is this ultimate reality uh, once observed? Is well, I guess everybody can observe it when, when they're dying, except they're probably too fearful to, exactly, to clean. Yeah. They, they neglect to be aware. Yes, exactly. That's, it. That's exactly right. That's the problem. That if if your, your mind is, is, is caught up in, in fear and clinging and craving for existence, then the, the moment of the clear, clear light of mind will be passed by and the next incarnation or rebirth or uh, how long do you have <laughs> before you pass by <laughs> 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 okay. 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 Uh, in the Abhidhamma it tells us that 
that uh, there is the moment of uh, death, that, that the moment of consciousness that corresponds to death, the uh, chuti chitta is what it's called. And it is preceded by what's called the uh, uh, rebirth linking chitta, in which some significant aspect of a person's karmic formations will arise in their consciousness. And it is, and, and that is what will be carried over and determine the nature of their next rebirth, because that is the uh, that is the karmic formation that will be present in the first moment of consciousness of the next uh, uh, of the next rebirth. So, so what is in what is present in a person's mind at the time of death is extremely important. If and that's why if uh, if someone can approach death with tranquility and serenity and love and compassion and uh, something that is outside of their own selfhood and outside of of, uh, their own fears and desires and hatreds and things like that. That it is the most beneficial possible uh, mental state because it will lead to to, uh, the mind taking as object, either either a, a knowledge and insight which is conducive towards them achieving enlightenment uh, as a part of the death process, or it will lead to the most beneficial sort of rebirth uh, and the potential for their enlightenment in the next life. I got a couple of times in my dreams already, and and uh, every single time I'm extremely grateful. Uh, Deeply, deeply, deeply grateful. Uh, and and I, every time I have a, have a dream about that, that's always the case. I'm always in tears of gratefulness. <laughs> and uh, and and I'll I'll you know try to try to thank everybody. <laughs> that's uh, well. Hang on to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> yeah. Um, or maybe that was you know you're. You're a happy person born into good circumstances, and you have you have had from an early age the opportunity to study the Dharma and be in uh, good companion. So perhaps that is what uh, that is the uh, rebirth in consciousness you came into this uh, life with. Um, it seems like a lot of people um, they're terrified about about you know having a bad rebirth because uh, close to the moment of death, you know, obviously there would be a great deal of pain and misery. Mm-hmm. And and it triggers a lot of imagination of how horrible it could it could be. Uh, pass you know, it passes already ter- terrifying state. And mm-hmm. and I can, I would imagine that is one of the greatest obstacles for a lot of people dying has to face because you know they know what misery is like. And they're afraid that it's going to get way worse and last way longer. Mm-hmm. And and how how do you convince them, you know, to become when when the real possibility of say going to hell for eons, you know, does exist? Well, as I say, you 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 encourage it if they if this is the view that they hold, then that's good. Then it's very easy to point out to them the tremendous advantage of uh, entertaining wholesome mental states oh. at the time of death. I see. So. But do they have the choice or are they overwhelmed with fear so that they, it, you know, because the pain they feel is constant, the fear they, mm-hmm. they have is constant. It, it's not easy to remove. Well, much is going to depend on the kind of karma they generated up to that point. Yeah, can't wait until the last minute. They have That's right, can't wait until the last minute. <laughs> right. I see. Yes. There are some subtle things in this discussion that uh, need to be pointed out. And that is that 
you, as far as I know, you are all still uh, attached to the idea of your own selfhood. And it is very difficult for you to think in terms other than that. And that being the case, the most beneficial way to discuss certain types of things is uh, in ways that use that attachment that you have to bring about, uh, to bring you closer to right view, to, to correct view. The part that is is difficult uh, is recognizing that the Buddha made it really, really clear that you have, there is no self to cling to. And without understanding the greater truth beyond that, the mind naturally, it's either or. Either I've got a self and I'm still going to have a self after I die, or I've got a self and I'm going to lose it. Uh, But the truth is, there's nothing to lose, because you don't have self now. (laughs) All you've got is the illusion of a self. And what continues from one life to another are the effects of your intentions and actions, not a self. So, how to understand this in in some way that's meaningful? A person is born somewhere into very unpleasant circumstances where there is a lot of suffering. And that person will say, why me? Why did this happen to me? As if there was a me there that it was happening to. And if it hadn't happened to that me, that there wouldn't still be a me there saying, why me? If there is, if a person is born into the world, there is going to be a mind with a sense of self saying, why me? And if we could somehow transplant that, how is that being into another and take this one and put it in the place, it's still absolutely indistinguishable. Do you see what I mean? The sense of self, the experiencer of the suffering, is not a unique and separate individual. All that there is, is the circumstances that a sentient being finds themselves in. So, There is, depending on what you do in your life and depending on what your mind holds prior to the moment of death, there will be a a sentient being or perhaps a number of sentient beings come into existence. The nature of their Uh, circumstances and the nature of their mind stream, their mental predispositions are going to be a result of that. And uh, I pointed, I just said, it could be one or it could be many, it doesn't matter. That is the sense in which there is continuation.
each of those individuals, I mean, so say that you could uh, recollect a number of previous lives. Are you those recollections? They're not, no. Our mind may seize upon those recollections as a reassurance, a comforting reassurance of its own of, of its own notion of self being a substantially existent entity. But it's false. Because those recollections are nothing but recollections. And even if you can go back and find, yeah, it really, really was a person, this name, lived in this house, did these things, just the way I recollected it, you're not that person. You'll never be that person. You never were that person. That person's that person. You are you. That person was the product of that person's mind. And you are the product of your mind. Um, there may be all kinds of connections between the two. But... <laughs> but you need to... To achieve enlightenment, you do need to be able to understand the emptiness of self. And the tricky part is to come to the place of understanding the emptiness of self without falling into the abyss of nihilism or annihilationism, which is, I sure feel like I have a self, so if I'm not going to be reborn, I'm going to be destroyed. And all the consequences of that. Well, if, uh, if a person does not experience ultimate reality, then it's easy to have uh, what you uh, have the line of thinking of what you just described, mm-hmm. uh, described nihilism. Uh, but ultimate reality, uh, I, I'm a t- I'm imagining it takes a great deal of meditative power to observe. Um, Well, meditative power can bring about the observation of it, but see, this is the thing that it happens in a lot of different ways under a lot of different circumstances. And there's a certain element of unpredictability about it. So uh, the so the meditation practice and the power of meditation and other sadhanas, practices, techniques, we're trying to take advantage of, of uh, what we know and understand to increase the likelihood, to increase the probability of it. Uh, so in that regard, if you, the more that you continue to increase uh, your meditation skills and the power of your meditation, the greater the likelihood that you are going to become enlightened. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you cannot become enlightened until you do this. Okay, you can become enlightened at any time. Remember, enlightenment is an accident. Spiritual practice just makes us accident prone. Right? Yes. So. You know, I don't hear many teachers talking about ultimate reality. You're, I want, then, then again, I haven't been exposed to so many teachers. Uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, what sources uh, that you gather for the information of your understanding of the ultimate reality? What are the sources of information? Because I just don't hear the teacher talking about mm-hmm. it. You're the, the one teacher that, that I'm hearing this from. Um, I don't know why that would be. There are, you know, if you're talking about literature, published uh, uh, texts and things like and that, there is there is much on that subject. I yeah. Um, once again, it keeps coming up over and over again. Mm-hmm. You didn't say this, but a lot of other people have. 
to get a reading list. I, I think I, I'm going to really have to put a reading list together in any of these things. Just, you know, so that there are, are sources that, that people can access easily. You know. Of course, Jackie is a student at the University of the West, so he may, he may be able to tell us the names of the sources that you go to right now. He's going to tell me Chinese and I won't Ultimately, yeah. Can, yeah so. Danny and maybe he doesn't want to. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the next paper? <laughs> mm-hmm. Are you a Buddhist? Are you a Buddhist? Uh, yes. Well, the text is all there. It's being seen. They use different notions. Sometimes you call ultimate, but most Buddhists who should like your life, your Buddha nature, uh, no, I'm not, uh, so, so Buddha nation and ultimate reality is uh, the same? I'm sorry? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Nirvana, Buddha nature, ultimate reality, emptiness. Yes. These are all talking about the all same. All the Mahayana emptiness. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. What well, Mahayana? Ma- Mahayana Sutra. Stand yeah, up again. Imagine. It's not from the original text one. Well, <laughs> well, it's a, it is also it is also in the original text of uh, early Buddhism. There, there are there are less differences between Mahayana and early Buddhism than yeah. than there appears to be. <laughs> it's, it's a difficult topic. It is since you mentioned, but if you look at the most um, all the uh, the Chipita, Chip, Chipitaka. Mm-hmm. And Buddhists always say when you are Arahant, you don't want to be reborn again. Mm-hmm. That's the word Buddhists say. Mm-hmm. And yet we all struggle with rebirth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yes. Difficult questions to difficult questions to discuss uh, intellectually and philosophically. Yes. But Buddha said there's no more. Uh, I think house builder. Yes. What what, is, what does he mean by building a house? Building it's kind of like we have to have to want to have a rebirth. Otherwise, we really wouldn't. You know, we have to really have. Have a lot of clean. You know, if you want to. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, the house is the uh, the house is that uh, sense of being a separate self. Sense of and being it is built. Self. It is built out of uh, out of desire, out of desire for sense experiences, and out of craving for uh, a separate existence. And if you actually go back and look at the sutras, it, the, the Buddha did not say, well, after I die, there will be no more house builder. He said, it's done now. And that was when he was, I think, 35 years old and he lived to be 80 years old. So the house building stopped then, not when he died. Well. He built a separate self, so he actually requires effort. So, so by not building, he's actually free of that effort to build something. You have to have effort. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> so you're looking for a break from all this building. <laughs> yeah. um, so. What what does what is a self? What is a self? Six senses. Well, um, six senses. There's really no self in it. But, the thing but I mean, in the most is. in the most general definition of the word self that you can think of, what what does that what is that indicating? 
What concept is that indicating? Me. Hmm? Me. Me. Mine. As opposed to, what's the opposite of me? You or them or other, right? Is self and other. Self, the entire concept of self is about separateness. That's it, right there. That's that's the whole secret. Your sense of self is your sense of separateness. Now, when you've divided all that is into two parts, self and (laughs) non-self, joy circle. Yeah, draw a circle. You do, but you've got these two parts: self, me. self, and not self. Me and not me. Self and other. And of course, the other thing that is uh, is uh, a part of this concept: you divide you divide the universe into two sections, and you identify with one and not the other. Now that's the t- that's the entire complete definition of self: separation and identification. And so, once you've done that, once you've done that, there will always be a struggle at the boundary between what's self and what's not self. Right? And you're going to want to to enhance the part of the universe that you call self at the expense of the part of the universe that you call not self. So, you know, and and the Buddha said, well, your body, that's not self. Oops, we just took that out of this circle and we put it out here with everything else. (laughs) Your feelings. Your feelings are not self. Take care of it. And your perceptions, they're not self. The circle is getting very small. Perceptions. Mental formations. That too? Okay. There's hardly anything left. Consciousness. Now there's nothing left. Ah. Is that such a bad thing? <laughs> Now you've got it all. So if you give up yourself, you gain the universe. That's what this is all about. Yes? I will watch you the cosmos. we we'll recycle star dust. Every we, atom in our body. Yes, right. Come from. <laughs> we, we, we recycle star dust. Yeah. We're a part of everything. And everything is not a bunch of things. Everything is a process. And we're part of the process. And uh, so you, uh, you and I are no different. And the, your suffering is my suffering. And my liberation is your liberation. Um, and so that simplifies things as lo- a lot. When you say that uh, your suffering is my suffering, are you saying that the suffering is of the same nature, or, or, uh, or the suffering belongs to everybody? <laughs> Both uh, both of those things and other things you could say are true. Suffering does belong to everybody, mm-hmm. and it is also true that they are of the same nature. But also that distinguish that distinction: your suffering, my suffering. The. Consciousness that knows my suffering 
And the consciousness that knows your suffering is not different. Is that why, you know, what we really try to do? Mm-hmm. To really have empathy towards everybody. Towards everyone. It, it's towards everything. Because, because there's not one exception that I find that I, if I try it and I cannot understand or right. have empathy towards somebody, and I know the suffering is of the same nature, mm-hmm. and and therefore I have to, in order for me to not have compassion, I have yes. to distinguish, you know, that's there and this is mine. Yes. That's right. Every being that you're talking about, what it has in common with you is that quality of of consciousness, of knowing, the luminous quality of mind, the clear light of mind. Every being that you speak of has that. And so that is what knows the suffering that occurs. So in that regard, as long as there is any sentient being come into existence in ignorance and as a result of that ignorance suffers, you're still being reborn into suffering. So you can become liberated from suffering in this lifetime. You can come to uh, understand emptiness your own emptiness and the emptiness of all things, and you can dwell in that emptiness and you can become free of suffering. But ultimate total enlightenment is not possible as long as one sentient being comes into existence out of ignorance and experiences suffering. So you can become liberated in this lifetime, but your ultimate Enlightenment requires that all ignorance be overcome and all suffering be overcome. So it's just a matter of time before everybody's enlightened. Mathematical colleagues, <laughs> it, it has to be like that. It just take a, it will just take a while. That's, all. that's right. From the point of from the point of view of, of time and space, which is still relative reality, and trying to understand the ultimate in terms of the relative, we can see that yeah that. Ultimate, the ultimate reality is the ultimate liberation of all beings. Yeah. So. Then you just come into Mahayana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So it's a natural progress in a way. Mm-hmm. Well, the, uh, the idea of this was was always there. It just yeah, yeah. needed to be spelled out more clearly. Yeah. yeah, implicit. So despite all the suffering in the world, it's actually something uh, something very hopeful because we know, you know, for sure one day everybody will be like <laughs> <laughs> for good. <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll make it so. We'll <laughs> and the first step is that we enlighten ourselves. And that's how we make it all happen. So that's a really good note to go have lunch on.